you oldie YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we're looking pretty good. Terrific. Awesome. All righty. Well, I think we should kick off. Uh, g'day to everyone uh, watching in either in the Zoom chat here on Facebook, on YouTube at oakbarrel.com.au slash live. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, into this virtual uh, tasting on um, uh, what is what day is it? It's Wednesday, uh, Wednesday uh, the 8th at the moment. Uh, we have a very, very special guest making their, what well, we could guess that be their third appearance here at the Oak Barrel, but two of them have been via computer link. Um, and normally when we're calling in uh, to other parts of the world, including America, we're actually on different uh, dates and, and that sort of thing. But tonight I can actually welcome Miles Munro, head distiller from Westwood, on the same day that it is here in Australia because it's about 2 a.m. where you are. So you've officially made it to Wednesday. So uh, congratulations. Happy Wednesday. And thank you for staying up uh, till 2 a.m. at the distillery. How are you? <laughs> Doing great. Thank you, Scotty. Thanks. Yeah, great to be here. Uh, it is it is 2 a.m. here in Portland, Oregon, but yes, same day. We're we're caught up almost. <laughs> we're, we're catching up. Um, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, we were just actually chatting about um, it was a little over a year ago, actually, last March, that I made an, an actual in-person appearance at Oak Barrel for my first presentation, and um, it's good to be back. It's it's always a great experience. Um, and you know, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, sounds like actually a few of you might have actually caught me in person last year. So welcome back to this. So yeah, my name is Miles Monroe. I'm the head distiller, head blender for Westwood Whiskey out of Portland, Oregon. Uh, Portland, Oregon is in the what we call Pacific Northwest portion of the U.S. in the states. That's the top left corner. We're actually just above California. Um, that's, uh, before we actually dive into that though, what I'd like to do is pour our first couple samples. So you've got three samples in front of you. You've got our new make, which is our unaged clear whiskey here. Um, and then also your second sample, which is the um, core expression Westward Black Label. Uh, go ahead and get those poured and we can uh, dive into those while we talk. I, um, yeah, leave the, uh, leave the red label for a bit if you can. So, Miles, just before we jump in as well, um, I mean, I know from experience with uh, distillers, uh, you know, lo locally in Australia, it's quite an early start to the day uh, often for them, particularly if they're brewing in and all that sort of stuff as well. What does an average Tuesday look like? You know, have you now officially racked up like 20 hours at the distillery? <laughs> an average day for myself? Yeah. Well, um, you know, we, we say once you're a... A head distiller or a head brewer, you know, you take the boots off. You know, you're not, uh, okay. not necessarily on the still as much anymore. That isn't to say that I don't have long days, but yeah, you know, we've got a we've got a team of distillers working for us here now. Actually, this is this is the distillery right behind me. I'm in our, our front tasting room, and uh, you can see one of our pot stills there. That's our eleven thousand liter wash still. Um, but you know, I've I've been with Westward for over seven years. I was at the beginning their only production distiller, so um, I had a, a lot of time by myself on the stills. Uh, but now we've brought on a, a full team. I've got actually six other distillers that uh, that work for me now. Um, but you know, my typical day has has changed over the years, as as my role has also. Um, you know, I'm the head blender as well, so you know, I'm I'm managing our team. I'm making sure that our production day goes on schedule. But you know, I'm also uh, I'm also babysitting 5,000 casks, you know, those are, uh, those are my whiskey of children. So, you know, I'm, I'm out at our barrel warehouse, which is a, a separate location than the distillery here. I'm taking samples, checking on barrels, um, racking into finished casks, that sort of thing. Um, you know, and until, you know, a lot of these uh, travel bans were put into place, I actually did quite a bit of this. I was actually on the road a lot, um, telling our story, bringing, bringing our story to people. Um, so honestly, you know, my day is, uh, it's, it's, it changes on a daily basis. So, uh, is the rest of the distilling team loving the fact that you're around 24 seven at the moment? 
Well, sure. I'm a nice enough guy. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, am I, you know, am I asking them too many questions about what they're doing? For sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know if I'm at the Oak Barrel at 2 a.m., I'm normally in trouble. Uh, there's normally a tape on the show. <laughs> Why hasn't the alarm gone on yet? What are, what are you drinking? Uh, well, so actually our our last shift left about a, an hour and a half ago. I just missed them. So I've, I've got the place to myself. So um, <laughs> I'm ready to get into some trouble too. Um, yeah, beautiful. <laughs> for sure. Well, so, you know, you mentioned the rest of our staff. That kind of, that kind of fits into the beginning of, of my story here, which, you know, we, we make a single malt whiskey. You know, it's, it's uh, all malted barley. It's 100% barley, right? There's no other grain uh, incorporated into the mash bill. And so here in Portland, um, you know, we don't really have much of a uh, long history of distilling, of making whiskey but we do have a actually pretty long history of making beer. We're a pretty, pretty well-renowned beer making city in the States. We've got actually over 80 breweries just in the city of Portland now, um, hundreds in the whole States. Um, you know, several of those having been around since the very early eighties. And so, you know, it's a very established culture here. Um, we're also actually just North of the, um, the uh, Willamette Valley has a great winemaking region as well. Uh, a lot of great world-class Pinot Noirs come out of the Willamette Valley. Um, and that's been a- Well, they drink in heaven, Pinot Noir. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, and so that's, that's you know, that's that's been going on here. I mean, you know, probably late 50s. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're kind of falling in line with these, you know, domestic craft makers, um, you know, with wine and with beer and now spirits. Um, and especially with single malt, you know, we we call our spirit American single malt. You know, we're we're establishing a new category of whiskey in the states because you know here bourbon is king. You know, it's it's all about the corn whiskey that is that has traditionally been what the states are known for, and it's what we drink in the states. You know, if we're drinking something domestic, it's bourbon. Um, if it isn't bourbon, you know, it's sometimes rye. And so, you know, breaking into this new category and trying to bring this to people. Um, what we really equate ourselves with is the craft beer movement. Um, I myself am an ex-brewer. Our founder, Christian, um, also an ex-brewer, actually owned a brewer at one point. And all of my distilling staff, they all come from the brewing worlds. Um, you know, it's, it's not only something that we think is essential to, you know, the production process of actually knowing about malted barley and the fermentation process that we think is important from a production standpoint, but also from a philosophical standpoint. Um, you know, we are using a brewer's malt. We are carefully selecting our grain, which is actually all grown here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, we have it malted by someone who typically malts uh, barley for beer. And we have it, uh, you know, malted to a certain specification that we like, that is not too far off from brewer's malt. And also we're using an ale yeast. We actually use a beer yeast to ferment our wash. And so, you know, our roots uh, here in Oregon are steeped in brewing, but so is our, our approach to making whiskey as well. And that's why we think it makes uh, um, a particularly unique style of single malt and something that we can say is very much um, an American version of a single malt. That's, that's an interesting point that you've sort of brought up. And I, just a quick question, we might be jumping a little bit ahead here, but um, obviously, you spent, we were talking before, when you did uh, come to Australia in March, uh, they made you work quite hard uh, in terms of you did a lot of different events, a lot of appearances. Um, you know, you're doing a lot of these things uh, and staying up to stupid o'clock to, you know, talk to the Australian market. Uh, one of the reasons that was given to me uh, as to why Westwood chose Australia as to be quite an early market to push into was that same mentality. We sort of get craft beer. It's a little bit behind where the American scene is, but it's flourishing from a, like when you're standing up in front of people or standing, uh, sitting down in front of a computer in front of Australians, do you see similarities between, you know, the reaction and the questions people ask compared to what you get in America? Yes, yes, that's, that's a great point. Thank you for bringing that up. It absolutely is. Um, quite a few similarities. Yeah, it's, it, uh, it's no coincidence that we chose Australia as our first export market. You know, I was there last year launching the you know our flagship the core and you know the stout cask which we're launching now that's that's coming to australia first as well and yeah i think that there's um 
there's similar appreciation for craft. I think there's the want for, you know, the exploration for new flavor, for new style, for just a new approach to something. Um, you know, you've got a lot of great whiskey makers there as well. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're both, you know, both cultures, both countries are, are leading the charge on uh, new world whiskey and, you know, really putting our stakes in the ground about what that can mean as far as, you know, not just experimenting for experimentation's sake, but actually establishing, you know, regional styles of these single malts in different places. Um, and also, yeah, I mean, of course, just the appreciation for craft beer in Australia as well, you know, um, uh, it's, it's just outstanding. It really is a kind of a no brainer for, for us to, um, yeah, chat with you guys. It's yeah. terrific. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's, I reckon now let's wrestle the conversation back into what we've got in, in front of us, because I know that if we were doing this tasting at the Oak Barrel, if we would speak for too much longer without actually drinking some whiskey, people would start throwing things at us. So I, I don't know how many you've had already tonight. Um, I, I, but I've had only, uh, the one gin so far today, so I'm pretty keen to get into something whiskey related. Yes, yes, no, that's great. And that's why I like to get, you know, the first uh, couple samples poured right away because I, you know, I attend these as much as I host them. And I'm, I'm with you on that. You know, you can get 25, 30 minutes into a tasting and no one's tasted anything yet. So I'm with you, absolutely. So if, if you do have your white dog and your westward port already, um, let's, let's pick up that white dog, that clear spirit first. And um, yeah, get in on those aromatics, give it a sniff um, and get a taste in. So, you know, we, we were talking about Westward's approach to making single malt and, you know, we, we are not really trying to emulate another style. We aren't desperate to really try and, you know, create something that's already out in the world. There's a lot of different single malts out there that I love, but um, you know, I would never try to replicate that. Those are already out there. They're already made. And so there were some serious questions we had to ask ourselves about whiskey and as far as, you know, what would make Westward stand out? What is the, what are, what are some of the reasons for creating an American single malt anyway? Um, and again, our approach is very much in the style of beer making, bring a lot of those flavors of fermentation to the forefront and actually have those carry through the aging process uh, into the final product. And so if you give the white dog a taste, I think um, a lot of those fermentation flavors jump out to you. So is this, is this the white dog, is this a product that you actually release in America? Like, can you, if you're at the distillery, can you buy this? It's not, no, it's not sold anywhere. We only bottle this for our tasting rooms and for tastings like this. Um, I think it's so much fun. I think it's absolutely crucial even to a tasting for us, for you to, to actually get an idea of what the white dog is like. Um, I mean, this is straight off the still, proof down to 90. This hasn't been filtered, has seen no time in wood. Um, it is obviously a little rough around the edges because it's young, but to me, this is still a very delicious new make spirit. You know, I think it's really very flavorful, but still very smooth. Um, not something I think is very typical of a lot of new makes, if you could even get the chance to try one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something that I'd love to do one day is do a new make tasting, just strictly new make at the Oak Bar. I reckon that'd be fun. Um, but uh, just for people playing at home as well, uh, 90 proof is 45% alcohol, um, which yes. we see in Australia. But um, something you just said that actually tweaked a question that I hadn't really thought about before with Westwood. Obviously, we've spoken a lot about single malt and single malt in America and, and what that means in an American market. But coming from the brewing background, when you play with a lot of different grain varietals, like different types of barley, but then obviously there's like roasting levels and people, you know, work with rye and other grains. Um, it almost seems like in the American market where people are expecting mixed grain whiskies, that that's a bit of an opportunity to go and make mixed grain whiskies. And we see that from a lot of the distilleries. What was the inspiration to almost, you know, put those rules on yourself to say, actually, we're going to make a single malt. So out of all the things we can play with, we're just going to play with one. Um, well, I think, well, there's a couple answers to that. I think the main one would be that all of us here making this whiskey agree that we feel that malted barley makes the most delicious, most complex tasting whiskey. Um, I'll go... We're lucky we're only streaming this in America, but uh, sorry, in Australia, but there might be some people still up that have heard that. So just be careful walking home. 
<laughs> I know those, those, those bourbon lovers, they don't mess around. Oh, of course. No, and that's nothing against bourbon at all. I, I love bourbon. There's many I enjoy. Um, I think, though, that, you know, you're, you're talking about, yeah, you know, there's, there's really um, mostly this either mixed mash bill or corn mash bill that people are generally turning to, which, yeah, I think that's a great opportunity to, you know, discover another way to express flavors through whiskey. Um, and, you know, with single malt, um, the other reason was really our environment. Up here in the Pacific Northwest, this is where most of the barley is grown in our country. You know, if you go down south to around, you know, Kentucky or into the Midwest and those areas, that's where all the corn is grown. So to me, that makes sense to make whiskey from corn. Um, you know, that speaks of its origins there. Whereas, you know, up here, it really wouldn't make too much sense to, you know, continue in that tradition to make a corn whiskey when not only is it where most of the barley is grown, but, you know, up in this area where in a colder climate, we have cooler summers, we have colder, wetter winters. Um, we're actually in the valley that we're in in Portland. We see 30% more rain than the, the, the average, um, the national average. And so it's just a very different environment anyway. Um, and so that, that to us, you know, says that, you know, this is perfect environment really in the US to make single malt. Um, and we, we want that. We want some provenance to our whiskey. We want to actually establish a regional style of single malt. And we, we want elements of the Pacific Northwest, elements of Portland and the surrounding area to actually come through in this whiskey. And so to us, um, yeah, single malt was the, was the way to go. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I did pour about half of my sample bottle then and then went, mm, no, no, I'm going to pour, finish the whole bottle in there. Um, because I think people at home and, you know, people who might have experienced this before, there's a lot of flavour in in this new make spirit. There's like a lot of like tropical fruits for me. The texture is really creamy and it's it's really more if you could, you could drink a lot of this. Um, obviously, this is the... The, the building blocks and obviously I'm, you know, I assume people at home have sort of got their head around it a little bit now, but this is the building block of where your whiskey is going. It hasn't seen oak and oak does impart flavors and textures and that sort of thing. What are you looking for in a new max spirit knowing full well that you're going to have these other elements play a part in the next couple of years? Sure. Well, primarily, honestly, what we're looking for in our new make is the majority of the flavor is the majority of the characteristics that we want in the final spirit. Again, you know, coming at it from this beer perspective, you know, we're using our particular ale strain is the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale Yeast Strain, which if anyone's had that beer, you know, it's an iconic American pale ale. And to us to, you know, grab the yeast strain that produces a lot of those flavors and put that into our whiskey, um, you know, yeah, exactly those tropical fruits, those great honey notes, um, some really big esters you know, those are going to come out when you use a particular yeast strain like that. And, you know, I like to say that we have this uh, minimalist approach to distilling. I mean, we're using pot stills, obviously we're making single malt, but our particular pot stills, you know, they're custom stills. They're ones that we designed for very minimal reflux, for very little refinement. Um, we want a lot of character. We want all of those fermentation flavors to come through the distillation process. Um, and that's kind of a dangerous game to play because if you, um, you know, if you have a fermentation that creates quite a few undesirable flavors or some off flavors, those are going to come through in your distillation. And so we're very careful with our fermentation. You know, it's a, it's a long fermentation. It's about five days. It's at a very low temperature. Um, uh, it's, you know, maybe 20 to 21 degrees. Um, you know, which is, is fairly cool for a whiskey fermentation. So we're very gentle with that. And, you know, throughout every step of the process, we're actually wanting to create more flavor every step along the way, rather than mask or take away any. So when you ask about, you know, what we're looking for in our new make spirit is really still just, you know, the, the spirit in its most raw form. We want to see those big fermentation flavors. We want that robust um, tropical fruit and ester to really come through. And then of course the grain, really. I mean, again, we're so careful and picky with our grain selection. I think that's a, another really nice aspect of this new make here is, uh, you know, it's got this sort of nutty kind of doughy character to it. And that's all malt, that's all coming through in that single malt. 
Yeah, right. it's it's interesting. It's actually really refreshing. Um, and it was refreshing, you know, in March is you could go to a, a year's worth of whiskey tastings that were, you know, maybe all Scotch single malt whiskey tastings, and you will never hear the word yeast, you know, mentioned at all. You know, you talk about barrels, sometimes, you know, particularly in the last five, 10 years, a lot more about barley strains and that sort of thing. But, you know, there's some people who, you know, come to a, a whiskey tasting, yeah, we use yeast because we because they have to, you know, it's a means to an end. So like for people who may be in that position, when you're talking about yeast and, and fermentation um, as a, you know, potentially the central point in your whiskey rather than what happens afterwards, like what does a different yeast strain actually do? Like what are they tasting in this that they wouldn't taste in a, in a different, is, is it those higher end florals or is it sort of something textual? Or? God, yeah, there's so much and it you make a good point. It's, I we're seeing it a lot more, I think, you know, these days, but yeah, for the longest time, yeah, yeast was really not talked about too much. Um, you know, people might say they have a proprietary strain, um, but yeah, it was very much, I think, was looked at for the longest time as just this particular step in the process produces alcohol, right? Um, but there's just so much more to it. You know, I'm, I have a biology background, um, a lot of us brewers, you know, are really very, very interested in fermentation. And that's a, a way you can experiment with a lot of different styles of beer um, or the particular strains. And, you know, you ask, so, you know, with a, an ale strain, especially an American ale strain, yeah, you get those big fruit notes, those honey notes. Um, you know, other ones can produce, yeah, either more floral notes or some spice, um, more ester, less. Um, if anyone's had you know, let's say like any kind of Belgian beer, you have an idea of, you know, maybe more phenolics are gonna come out in those particular yeast strains, you more of that clove and spice, um, banana, you know, those are, those are all produced by that yeast strain. Yeah, I mean, there's an infinite amount of, you know, flavor combinations you can get from different yeast strains and different grains. And, and so, you know, yeah, I mean, we've actually experimented with a few different types um, not to go too far off subject here, but we're actually going to be releasing soon for our whiskey club here in the States, a whiskey that we made with sourdough yeast, with the sourdough Levant. Um, we've got a pretty famous baker here in town. His name's Ken Forkish. Um, he has written this award-winning book on baking. He's got some great bakeries and restaurants around town. He's got this, you know, 300-year-old Levant that he brought back from France, I imagine illegally. But, um, you know, it's the basis for all his baking. And, you know, he, he came to us one day and asked if we would want to use some of this to make a whiskey. And, you know, a, a Levon is a, is a combination of yeast and bacteria. So we weren't really sure how that was going to go. Um, we made a small batch of it first. And the, the wash itself, the beer wash, was absolutely horrific. It just tasted terrible. But, you know, we ran it anyway because, you know, there was alcohol in there and we needed to get it out. And it made the most beautiful floral new make it had this kind of rye spice to it it just blew our minds and so um yeah we made four barrels of ken's sourdough whiskey which we're actually is is about three and a half years old now we're releasing it here in the next couple months so yeah, yeah it's a huge flavor impact and i do wish more people talked about it um it makes a huge difference hmm. i mean i think we can almost potentially be our own worst enemy um in the sense that we've spent so long, particularly with single malt, talking about regions and age and barrels of 50% of the flavour and then the rest is made up by distilling and that sort of stuff. But I think that's what makes whiskey in general, doesn't matter what style, so fascinating and so you know, romantic is you've got grains, water, yeast, still and oak. And you can make so many different things from those like three to five ingredients where you count oak and copper as an ingredient. And you can't always, you know, pinpoint exactly where it's coming from, you know. And famous, famous stories of distilleries not, like, you know, getting cobwebs out because that might have a say in something somehow. We just won't touch anything. I think that's part of the, the love of it, I reckon. And so I, I think it's exciting that we get to talk about another, you know, mystical thing about whiskey. Yeah. Yeah, no, great point. I mean, there really are just those five elements and there's so much that can be done. Yeah. And yeah, you know, if, if a distiller, you know, if a maker wants... 50% or 60% of their flavor, you know, to come from the wood, they can choose to do that. You know, there's, there's ways of doing that. Yeah, you can, you can add and subtract, you know, in, you know, in a particular order of these five elements to make the spirit that you want to make. And that's, 
that's what's great about this. Yeah, it really is. is yeah. You know, um, just changing one of those elements, even slightly, um, you just open up another door into a, just a whole new world of whiskey. It's pretty incredible. And that's... And a, a, quick, a quick shout out, sorry, uh, Miles, to Chris Ray on Facebook that says, starting a tasting with new make should be standard practice. Uh, so fantastic. So, uh, you know, thank you for making this available um, and for the team in Australia. And maybe that's a rule I'll put in place in a, you know, when we relaunch physical tastings here, it's that every, no matter what it is, got to start with new make. I'm, so, I'm sorry, 40 year old Talisker, you know, you got to bring new make, otherwise you're not allowed to do it. Maybe I can get that rolling. Might go down well, might not. I love it. It does though. I mean, yeah, you know, so let's, let's grab our second sample and then we can, yeah, we can see in this particular situation, of course, you know, what time in barrel and what contact with Oak does to Westward, going from that new make to Westward here. It's it's amazing. And just my initial comment here, obviously I had this whiskey a few times and every whiskey in your environment and the time of day, it's always going to taste a little bit different, you know, what you had for lunch. But I had such a heightened um like appreciation of the oak in this straight away because I was coming from the new make. If I hadn't had that new make just then, I probably would have been a different thing. But it was just fascinating how just the oak and that's all I thought about for that first couple of seconds was, wow, like, that's what oak tastes like. Um, yeah. Which I, I wouldn't have got if I, you know, if this was my first whiskey. Absolutely. It, it, it puts it out there for you. It highlights that wood. And, mm. you know, so we age on new oak. These are all new oak barrels. Um, here in the States, you know, that's, that's the standard for bourbon and for rye uh, is going into new, never before used charred white American oak. Then of course, all our barrels, you know, travel around the world and everyone else uses them over and over again um, until they're, you know, these neutral vessels. Um, you know, so that's, that's a legal requirement for bourbon. Uh, American, Single malt doesn't actually have a a classification that is um, that is, I guess, uh, enforced by our government. And so we could actually choose to use new barrels. I'm sorry, used barrels if we wanted. But you know, another aspect to creating our style of single malt, the American style of single malt, is you know, um, single malt for the the, the adventurous palate. And so. Um, you know, we wanted to use brand new oak barrels. Um, I think we'll eventually, I mean, we have actually experimented with used barrels, but we wanted that stronger element of oak to come through. Um, but, you know, we're talking about ultimately balance, right? Everything, you know, everything good has a balance to it, whether it's whiskey or, you know, a particular, you know, dish. Um, most things, you know, if they can be appreciated by a broader spectrum of people have balance, right? And that's what we want to achieve. And so, yeah, there is a big, big element of oak to this, but I don't think that it's too overpowering. I think that you can still get a lot of elements of the new make in there. You can still get the grain. You still get some of those great fruit notes. Um, you know, they've also changed through years of oxidation. There's still some tropical fruit, but now, you know, you get a little more stone fruit uh, coming through in that mature spirit in that way. But yeah, so, you know, in a way to kind of control that wood um, that new oak uh, aggressiveness, assertiveness that, that really comes from it is, is we use what we call a low char barrel. So, you know, we're talking about barrel char, you know, with new barrels, basically we've got a one through a four um, set of standards. And that's, you know, charring is where you're lighting the barrel on fire and allowing it to burn for a certain amount of time. Uh, char one's um, 15 seconds, char two's 30, char three's 35. Char four is a full 55 seconds of burn. Um, you know, there's other cooperages that experiment with longer burns than that, but you know, char four, we call it alligator char here in the States. It just, it really looks like a, you know, an alligator's skin, um, just, just really um, charred through a good solid half an inch of the wood stave itself. And, you know, um, char of course will um, act as charcoal really and remove a lot of the off flavors it adds a lot of you know color to it as well so you know when you're talking about new wood you know the higher the char the more influence that wood's going to have overall in the spirit itself yeah uh, a quick g'day to alex dahlenberg friend of the stream friend of the distillery um who i think had a bit of a mixed week there at the speakeasy group because they got great bars in sydney and great bars in melbourne I think poor old Nick and Norris has tried to open about seven times this year already and keeps getting shut down. 
Um, so I hope so, all's doing well there. But um, just on the, the charring, we're seeing a lot of, yeah. I met her through you. Yeah, probably. <laughs> that happens sometimes. You went to Mjolnir. That's right. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, we had good chats about grains and yeast that day. Um, the, um, you know, we, when we talk about charring, you've got those charring levels. One of the questions I want to ask you is we're seeing like a lot more, at least it might be more prominent in America, but toasted barrels. And I, you know, speaking to a few coopers and they talk, okay, people talk about barrel char, but there's actually a toast level as well in a lot of them that people don't sort of think. And sometimes the char is, you know, subtracting away from the, the spirit in the sense of you're cleaning it, you're taking negatives, but the toast, which is a softer, um, you know, and deeper into the barrel is actually going to add things from the depths of the staves in. Is that something that you sort of think about, like, you know, the toast and the char on a barrel? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely we do. Yeah, you know, when you talk about toasting and charring, you're talking about, you know, you're breaking down the hemicellulose of the wood. That's the structure of oak. That's what, you know, puts it all together. And, you know, when you're, when you're toasting or lightly charring, you know, you're bringing out the lactones and you're bringing out, you know, the kind of coconuts and vanilla and baking spice characteristics of the wood of the oak are being brought out. And then when you char to the point of actual, you know, charcoal, you're, you're then really removing those aspects as well. So um, yeah, cooperages will toast first to kind of help get the barrel a bit more malleable and then char on top of that toast. Uh, and then there's, of course, there's a lot of whiskey producers that prefer, you know, toasted heads to add a bit more of an element there. Um, we've experimented with that as well. Um, but, you know, we've, I guess in our, you know, I don't know, 10th year or so of making Westward, you know, we, we like about an 18 month air cured wood stave and about a two char. Um, yeah, with some toast underneath, absolutely. I think that's that's crucial to consider for sure, definitely. Yeah, that will add a lot more depth of flavor to your whiskey. Just on that concept as well of experimenting around with, with different things, a question from Matt Wooler um, on, on the Facebook here, which I think is, as he points out, probably could be a question to any small distiller um, in, in the world, is that as, as you increase your size and your production and the demand, um, you know, do you saw like, how do you keep that experimentation going when you need structures in place to, to meet the demand? Like, are there certain stills that you have that are little play things? Or like, how do you keep yeah. that fun? But with obviously your businesses want to grow and get bigger. Of course. Well, honestly, man, it's, it's hard to stop us from trying. I think most brewers, distillers, winemakers, we're just creative people in general. It's just, that's in our nature. And, you know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to not. I mean, yes, of course, there's, you know, the day to day, you know, production needs that uh, should be met. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it's just, it's just built into us. It's, it's woven into the fabric of what we do. Um, I'd say, you know, yeah, I mean, I have a pilot system here, you know, we have a small, uh, we have a small still that I've built. I've had a welder friend build out of a keg um, that we'll do experimental batches on for sure. Um, but it, you know, what we were talking about earlier, as far as even, you know, altering just one tiny aspect of one of those five elements. And you really do have, you know, a very different expression of a whiskey. And, you know, when we, uh, when we moved into this facility here, that was 2015 when we had this built, um, we were just a mile down the road before that for, for quite a long time uh, in a much smaller, almost like the size of a closet of a distillery. And so moving into this space here, we had the opportunity to kind of rethink about, you know, rethink what we were doing, our approach, you know, do we want to try maybe making some rye, getting into some bourbon? Um, and we decided that single malt was our passion, that we were going to do one thing and we we're going to do it as well as we could. Now, that doesn't mean we have to just do the same thing over and over again. Um, but, you know, to that question, um, yes, we love to experiment. Uh, I mean, try and stop us. You know, it's just not going to happen. But also, you know, the nature of production, I think the nature of any craft really is, you know, you're attempting to make something you know, with your hands, you know, this is done with no automation, this is done by a human. And so to try to replicate something actually every day over and over to make it the same is in itself an incredibly hard challenge. And something that I think, you know, with the right person would never get boring. Um, it's actually maddening sometimes to try and actually recreate the same thing over and over. But, you know, I think that's how you hone your craft. That's actually as a maker, just how you get better. And, 
I mean, you know, you just come into work every day, you know, thinking I'm going to try and do it just a little bit better than I did yesterday. And I hope that doesn't come off as too corny, but you know, you ask about experimentation and you know, really every, every day we're just, uh, we're just trying to steer the ship in the right direction. Yeah. I think potentially the, like the best example of that sort of mindset I've seen is uh, the Archie Rose distillery, which is just um, up the road from us here. Beautiful distillery has a bar in it as well. They're building another distillery uh, a little bit further south in Botany that's going to be their main production house. And somehow Dave and Tristan, the team there, have convinced whoever's paying for it to keep that other distillery at the at the bar going. So it's just their experimental plaything. So they're going to make booze here. And that was just whoever was in that meeting and you know got that across the line. I tip my hat to them because that that's an excellent like. I'm sure there was some you know. People looking at financials like, but you know, we we've got three stills. We could just sort of move it. No, no, we need we need new ones. Need new ones. Keep those ones there. Brilliant piece of negotiation. Whoever did that, but um, Dave Weathers, very well done. Very well yeah, done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, for those who are drinking along with us, and uh, and John Hitchin, um, who asked the question, the, the second whiskey is this is the one that we've seen around the most. It's the one we're going to see around the most uh, forever. Um, so this is the. Um, the classic Westwood American single malt. Now, one thing that I've found interesting about this is, again, that concept of what we spoke about earlier, um, of how how does a consumer understand a whiskey when there's been so much with the word single malt has been so aligned to the word of casks, to actually take that out of the equation is a bit of a different thing because in, a, in the Australian market, we don't see a huge amount of virgin oak casks unless they're through, you know, bourbons and rye. So here's a single malt in a, in a virgin oak cask. Obviously, in America, that's a little bit reversed in that people are used to those first, uh, those, you know, brand new American oak, virgin oak casts, but not necessarily seeing the word single malt um, on the label. So I mean, like, how have you found that, you know, people understanding the brand both domestically, but then, you know, around the world? Well, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a hurdle here, of course, again, bourbon is, is king. And, and I think for a lot of people, um, really the only whiskey that they, you know, would, I guess, consider um, something that, uh, I, well, I'll say this. So, so coming to Australia, I didn't actually realize uh, until getting there that, you know, when you say whiskey in the States, people assume you mean bourbon. And when you say whiskey, I mean, really anywhere else, um, people think you mean single malt or a malted, you know, a blend, blended malt, really. That is, that is whiskey. That's what people, I think, generally associate with the word whiskey. And so, you know, to bring Westward to Australia, I mean, it, it just seemed like um, conceptually very easy for people to understand and to just latch on to, you know, what we're doing right away. Um, yeah, you know, whereas, whereas here, I think, you know, we get a bit kind of caught up with, well, uh, you know, it's a single malt, so people, you know, can assume, oh, okay, so it's like scotch, you know, and it's peated, and we say, well, no, um, well, is it not bourbon? No, it's not bourbon because it's not corn. Um, so yeah, we get a bit more of a hurdle here. Um, you know, I think that's also why that why we um, we love to appeal to beer drinkers. Um, I, I think that people who are interested in craft beer. Um, can really latch on to the idea of craft whiskey and especially American single malt a lot quicker in that way. Um, and again, all of us being, you know, from the brewing world um, and using that as an inspiration to make the whiskey, that's just sort of a natural course of action when, when it comes to marketing and to presenting what we're doing and trying to get our point across. And so, you know, that kind of brings us, well, no, I think that directly brings us to our, our third sample here. So let's go ahead and pour our red label. This is uh, what we're launching in Australia now. This is Westward Oregon Stout Cask. And a quick g'day to Mark Westmoreland, who uh, works at the uh, Wolfburn Distillery up the top of Scotland in Thurso. Uh, and this is quite cool, talking about, like, different appreciations of whiskey, because right now we've got... Um, Paul Miles, who was getting very close to 3 a.m. in the morning in, in America. Uh, Mark at about, yeah, would it be almost 20 to 11 in the morning um, up the top of Scotland. And lucky Scotty just sitting here on an evening having a, a regular Wednesday night. So uh, I think yeah, that's, that's pretty special. I have people from all over the world. And I'm very happy to have lucked out and got the, the proper uh, time zone for this one. I love it. Yeah, you, you've definitely won here for sure. Um, 
Yeah, and you know what though? But I mean, honestly, right. So I mean, this is this is the world whiskey. Single malt brings the world together. Honestly, it, it really does. Um, so I'm sure in uh, in your craft brewing circles in Australia, I actually saw it. We we visited Young Henry's when I was there. Um, I mean, to name one of many, but. You know, here in the States as well, brewers are just absolutely ravenous for whiskey barrels. You know, they want fresh, wet whiskey barrels that they can put their heavier, you know, higher ABV, darker beers into, um, you know, kind of give that beer a bit more of a spine, bolster those flavors, up that alcohol just a little bit, and bring a, bring a bit of a, you know, whiskey nuance to that beer. So, you know, we almost immediately started handing out our barrels once we were, you know, emptying them to package our whiskey. Um, you know, we've got a lot of, you know, ex-co-workers, colleagues, friends still in the brewing industry here um, that we just started, you know, lending barrels out to, uh, to age their beer in. Um, but, you know, uh, something that's uh, pretty great about Portland is, you know, we're a city full of makers. It's not just, you know, beer and wine and, and spirits, you know, it's, you know, incredible chefs, incredible musicians, um, it's, it's very much geared toward that. What, what's also great about it though, is it's a very collaborative city. Everyone's really just supportive of what everyone else is doing. We're all very interested in whatever the people are doing. Um, and so in that way, you know, a lot of collaborations are just born out of this uh, mutual interest. And so that's where our stout cask finish comes from. A particular brewery that I actually used to work for, um, for a few years when they first opened before I came to Westward to make whiskey, um, they make this amazing Belgian chocolate imperial stout every holiday season. So I had sent them a barrel, actually, just one. They're a pretty small brewery. But uh, long story short, that barrel ended up back in my hands here at the distillery after they had aged their beer in it for about six months. Um, it just kind of, you know, this light bulb went off. You know, when you drink Westward, you get, you know, these great grain notes. Uh, to me, the finish has this really nice roasty chocolate finish to it. Um, the idea of putting that whiskey into a, a barrel that had held stout, I just, uh, you know, that flavor match seemed to be absolutely perfect. And so uh, that's where this was born. So this actually spends an entire year in that barrel, which is held stout beer. Um, if everyone hasn't had a sip yet, please do. Yeah. Again, like I've had a lot of this whiskey. Um, like first tried it back in last March when you were here. I've drunk a lot more of it in the past or, you know, month or so that's been in Australia. But I've never tried this whiskey apart from that day when I was sort of up the back. But recently, new make, you know, single malt stout cask. So I had all the tropical fruit in my head when I went on to the um, American oak, so the, the single malt, where, you know, I was getting, I was, the oak was the thing that jumped out at me. Then, like, I've got my head around that. Jumping onto this, it's all those roasty, nutty flavours, you know, is the bits that I'm appreciating because it wasn't in the first two. You know, the tropical fruit's still there, but the bit that jumped out to me straight away was just that rich, almost mocha, dark chocolate sort of, yeah. but like not not the bitterness, not the tannin, but that sort of like, um, yeah, mocha in, in coffee sort of thing. Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> you know, in approaching this project and again, wanting so much of our, you know, raw material and fermentation flavor to really jump out of the glass in the finished product, I was careful in approaching, you know, a finished style um, you know, in a way that wouldn't really alter the original spirit too much. You know, again, a finish, not, not a flavoring, not a masking. It's a finish. And so really it should highlight certain aspects of the whiskey um, that are there, you know, in its original form and then kind of just turn those up a bit. And uh, yeah, I think, yeah, definitely those roasted, um, toasty, kind of biscuity, chocolatey notes really pop out for sure. Um, and you get a really great floral aroma as well. I really like the aromatics on the stout cast finish. I think those are, to me, probably the biggest change going from the, um, you know, American single malt to the stout cast finish. Yeah. Um, it just kind of dries it out. It's a bit more delicate. And there's really nice floralness to it. So uh, Westward Core, our core expression, spends um, four to five years in New Oak. Uh, again, we get a lot of rain here. We've got pretty cool winters, but it, it never really freezes. Uh, which is great for maturation. You know, once you get um, once you get towards that freezing point, maturation halts. Um, but we have these kind of you know warm, dry summers as well. You know, it actually does stop raining for about four months here. And so you know, we see 
Um, we see a uh, loss in water rather than alcohol. We actually see a rise in proof over time. Um, you know, we get a good extraction from that wood, but it's, it's a gentle process. And, you know, to us, four to five years is enough time. Uh, we want this whiskey drunk young. You know, it's, it's designed to be a younger whiskey. We want it to be bright and robust. We want you to get that, you know, nice malted barley to come through and those fermentation flavors that, you know, over time will either change or just be lost through uh, either the wood contact or through oxygenation over time. And, you know, that's not necessarily better or worse. It's just a different whiskey. You know, a, you know, an 18 year whiskey drinks very differently than, you know, something that's even 12 or 10 years old or five, you know, it's, um, we want that brightness to come through and that's something that we don't want to lose too much of. So, um, yeah, we feel like, you know, it's not necessarily about a particular number in age. You'll see, of course, that we don't have age statements on the labels. You know, it's, I always say it's maturity rather than age. Um, you know, that's, that's age to taste. And so um, the idea to, you know, spending a little more time in barrel for a finish, again, I was very careful in that approach and not wanting it to really alter too much of that original spirit. And so when we get these barrels back from the brewery, I actually don't rinse them. Um, there's still actually a little bit of beer. I mean, not much, but there's a you know, there's a bit of beer, there's a bit of trube, a bit of yeast from that secondary fermentation. It's still in that barrel. Um, and to me, that is almost kind of like a barrier between the wood for a little while with the spirit. Um, it also softens it up as well. To me, uh, the stout cast finish has a bit of a smoother mouthfeel to it. Um, it's a little drier. Uh, it's just a little, um, it's a more of a um, sort of approachable sipping whiskey in that way. And I attribute that mouthfeel and that softness to not rinsing the barrels and actually, um, you know, using a, an additional year in barrel, but kind of softening it up in that way. Yeah, I do. I do love that old whiskey trick of, oh, you know, it's got a little bit of stout and it's got a little bit of sherry left in the barrel. Should, no, we'll just, just leave it there. We won't tell anyone, but we'll just leave it there. Um, but it's, it's interesting that what you were sort of saying about the, the concept of the finish. And I think when the word finish was first introduced, and I'm going to pick on Scotch here a little bit. It was that sort of concept 10 years ago of that whiskey is not particularly good. Let's finish it for a couple of months in a red wine cask or rum cask or something. To, and it was to hide imperfections and not a good whiskey. But, you know, this is, you know, some cases 20% of its life in that stout cask. So, yes, it's a finish, but it's actually quite a substantial finish compared to other parts in the world. So I know there'd be certain distilleries that would call this like a double maturation or, a you know, the mm. Westwood double oak or something like that. So... Yeah. I think, you know, that's a, a good thing as well that, you know, we were talking about all the preconceptions about whiskey and how we talk about whiskey that the word finishes that can actually be quite broad in what that means rather than just a quick jolt of something sweet to brighten it up. Sure. Well, and, you know, yes. And our, I will say that, you know, the additional year um, in another barrel might not be the most accurate way of putting it because I'm actually racking... Um, Westward, that's about two and a half to three years old into these stout barrels. So they're not actually at maturity yet. They're not actually close to, you know, being ready to be taken out of the barrel. I'll actually rack them when they're fairly young. So, um, yeah, we're allowing them to reach their maturity in that second barrel. Um, yeah, so, so it's almost like a third of their life then, you know, in some cases. Yeah, in some cases it can be, definitely. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, we're just, you know, we're dealing with a barrel that's a bit more neutral and a bit softer and has a bit less to offer there. Um, you know, and those brewers, of course, are going to try to get as much of that beer out of that barrel as possible. But, um, yeah, and so, you know, this project started with just one barrel going to one brewery and coming back to us, you know, a year later discovering that it made an incredible whiskey that we were all very happy with. Um, and so that, you know, that started sort of this barrel loan program where we were trading barrels or loaning barrels out to breweries all across the states, you know, with the stipulation that, you know, if they put stouts in it, that uh, they could have the barrel for free until they gave it back to us. And so that's kind of created this whole other job for another person here <laughs> working with like 45 or 50 different breweries now, which is great, which is really exciting. And, and, you know, it's fun to collaborate with everyone, but now we need someone to keep track of where all our barrels are so we can get them back and, you know, kind of grow this expression up. We actually last August 
Uh, this reminds me, I need to reach out to them. Last August, we sent, um, I sent 80 of my recently emptied barrels to Deschutes Brewing. Um, Deschutes, I think, is actually, um, has some distribution in Australia. Um, great brewery here in Central Oregon. They've been around since, I think, 1984. Uh, they make incredible barrel-aged stouts. And so, yeah, we sent a big bulk of barrels out to them, um, which I think we'll be seeing back here probably within the next month or two um, to age more stouts. Yeah. yeah. Um, progressive and experimental from Mark. Yes, uh, exciting times. I do agree. It's a, it's a golden era for whiskey all around the world. Uh, and a request from Matt for uh, lemonade cask, uh, please, down the track. So... Um, that's quite an interesting one because I'm not sure I'm familiar with lim, you know barrel aged lemonade um, to get the casks from. So there you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'll look around. I'll see what we can find. I mean, if anyone's doing it, they're they're doing it here in Portland. That's yeah. for sure. Uh, question in the Zoom chat from Raf. Um, like, are you are you doing? You're, you're just using stouts from Oregon at the moment. Uh, would you look wider afield in the future? Yes. Yes, absolutely. I love that question. We have actually just started doing that. So in January, I sent, I sent two barrels to Denver, Colorado, um, which is, yeah, probably about, I don't know, a um, thousand miles away from here. They're a great, they're a great brewery um, in Denver that, um, yeah, we just connected and started talking. And so I, I shipped them two of my barrels and hopefully um, you know, that'll be something that we can continue to do. I'd, I'd love to send them further. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, something like a, a young Henry's, I think that would be amazing. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I'm, I'm sure there's some breweries here that'll, uh, will happily work with you. Just, you know, getting things in and out of countries at the moment. It's a little bit difficult, but we'll, we'll figure yeah. that out. Yeah. Eventually. Um, Eventually. I, I remember back to last March and I think it's been a common thread is that when we came out of that tasting doing largely what we've done, but with a beer, and I think there was a single cask in there as well that you brought over, is that the Australian markets sort of got this stout cask before they got the other whiskies. I think because of that extra cask influence, it doesn't matter what the cask influence was, but the fact that it was there, um, they sort of got their head around it. So, I mean, this has been a really popular uh, whiskey. I remember on the night, is that coming to Australia? Well, no, last miles, no, no, yeah, maybe, maybe whatever. And then when it, it did land, people sort of remembered and they jumped on it uh, really quickly. So I think that's quite an interesting little case study. It's, and particularly if you're, from my point of view, putting both of the whiskies in front of someone um, at the front counter here, it's the stout cast they lean towards. That appreciation of the American, uh, the single malt comes, but just after a couple of minutes once they've sat with it. So I think that's, I mean, is that, do you find that in the States as well or? Definitely, definitely do, yeah. Um... I mean, they, you know, I like to do, I like to do blind tastings more often than not, um, just to, just to kind of get an idea of, you know, you know, an, an, an opinion that isn't too, too influenced. And I agree. Yeah. The, the stout is, is generally preferred a bit more. Absolutely. It's, it's just, you know, as I said, I mean, it's hard to say how, you know, people prefer to drink their whiskey in what aspect or, or even what kind of environment they're gonna have whiskey, how they like to drink their whiskey. Um, I think something like, you know, Westward Core Expression is wonderful to mix. I think it's great in a highball. Um, but yeah, the stout finish, you know, it's, it's something you're gonna sip on. I think it's something that could actually be, you know, easily accompanied by a beer or, um, you know, a cigar or, you know, a meal or a nice chocolate. And so, you know, when you're tasting people on the straight spirit itself, I can see why stout cask would immediately be a bit more approachable for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. I, hopefully, yeah, you, you can find enough breweries to uh, keep it coming and because we'll, we'll keep drinking it uh, if you, if you keep oh, making it. Um, <laughs> look, funny. mate, um, if, if there's anyone got any, any questions, get them in now because I'm going to let Paul Miles uh, go in about five minutes because it is getting very, very close to 3 a.m. Um, over there. So I really do. Yeah. Really? Time okay. flies when you're having fun. Um, it's yeah, yeah. But that's one thing, and obviously, uh, you know, we're not traveling as much anymore. But um, I can't wait to get to get over there and um, and see this place that I now seem to know quite intimately, but only through computer screens to actually see it in the flesh. Um, but just over your right shoulder, there's a little green light 
that's almost uh, it's been flashing all tasting it's been it's been awesome it's almost like the um you know the great gatsby where the, you know there's something in it sort of just drawing me in so um yes. it, I, I will get there eventually um uh, just a couple of last questions coming through uh, one from damien here in the zoom uh, any other cast types uh finishes that you're looking at for the future certainly yeah well you know again wanting to create a regional style of single malt something that speaks of its origin something that comes from the pacific northwest you know for us i don't think it would really be uh true to our ethos to try something like a sherry or port finish because those those aren't some those aren't made here in the pacific northwest you know those aren't really things that come from our region. And so, but what, what does come from a region, you know, we mentioned it earlier in the talk, is really amazing Pinot Noir. We have incredible winemakers here in the Valley um, and we're friendly with them, of course. And so, yeah, I mean, we're, we've got a Pinot Noir finish that we've been working on for, for several years now, for sure. It's actually was supposed to be released here in the States last month obviously things have kind of thrown all of that off. Um, I actually did send a version of our Pinot finish to Australia last year to um, the Whiskey Club. Mm. Whiskey Club Australia actually got uh, a blend from me of mostly Pinot Noir finish um, westward. And so, yeah, we, we've been working on that. I mean, really we're, you know, that's our main focus because the Pacific Northwest is known for Pinot Noir, but that isn't to say that I mean, you know, we got winemakers that are, you know, we've got Tempranillo. Um, we've actually tried um, a few other different types, uh, some varietals of wine. Um, but yeah, we're, we're releasing some other fun stuff. I mean, we've done, you know, a few other different beer styles of cask finish as well. But, you know, these are kind of one-offs that we'll release to our club or that are, you know, tasting room only. But I would say, yeah, we're, we're making a serious effort to bring uh, Westward Pinot cask finish out to the world very soon. One thing I haven't been able to stop thinking about uh, since you mentioned it earlier is our uh, your, your friend down at the bakery there. And I'm a big fan of olives and olive oil, and I love a good just bread and olive oil. So maybe we can reverse engineer this. I would love to see a bread made specifically for dipping into Westwood whiskey. Now, I, I haven't done, I don't know if that's a thing or not, but I would love to see it. I think if, if anyone can sort of pull it off, it's probably the fine people of Portland, Oregon that can make that happen. But I like rock up at a, you know, a cheese platter in the, in the park and you pour a little bit of whiskey out and dip some nice sourdough in there. That's a world that I would like to live in, I think. <laughs> well, we did have a, a pretty large cheese maker here. Uh, they're national, actually. They're called Tillamook Cheese. They uh, bought a barrel. I sold them a barrel of my whiskey last year and they did an aged cheddar in uh, Westward. So, yeah, you're, you're right on it. You're like-minded. <laughs> Yeah, bring, it, it might get me more excited about food if we can bring it closer to the whiskey industry. I would like to see that. <laughs> I'm on board. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, look, mate, uh, again, thank you for your time. I know that last time we did this, it was about one o'clock on a Saturday, so it made more sense for everyone. Uh, you, you drew the short straw this time and uh, staying up till, till all hours. What, what time are you due back in today? Oh, well, um, you know, everybody knows I'd be up a bit late tonight, so... Um... I'll, uh, I'll wander in a bit later. Yeah. Perks, perks of delegation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Scotty, thank you so much for having me. Really, it's a pleasure. Ple no, mate. You, you do all the hard work and do all the distilling, and we just get to sit here, drink, and talk about it. So we, we've got the easy one. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, and I look forward to, as you know, everyone's sort of saying here, West, Westwood Butter. Yeah, that could be a good idea. Um, to everything you guys come up with, uh, whiskey or bizarre things otherwise. So, so thank you. And, um, Hopefully we'll be in the same room in the not too distant future. That sounds perfect. Thanks. And of course, you've got a standing invitation to the distillery anytime. Cheers, Just everyone. Follow, follow that green light. Right.